While you're getting there, let me ask you a, a hypothetical question. Have you ever played this mental game? This mental game. If only I had fill in the blank, I could fix this. If only I had a billion dollars, I could fix world hunger. I used to play that, especially when I was younger. This is a good teenage game that we play. When we're teenagers, we look at some of these problems and we think, why doesn't someone just fix this? As we get a little older, we start to realize it's more complicated. If only I could be king for a week, I could sort this whole planet out. If only I owned the company, we wouldn't have these problems. Ever thought that? Or... If only I was in the Shire Council, everything would be fixed. The economy, the environment, laws, medical care, education. At any given time, correct me if I'm wrong, a large portion of the population is absolutely sure that if only they had enough power and resources, it would all get ironed out. A vast amount of the people in our town and in our world are thinking right now, if they only let me get a hold of that, I could fix it. It's, it's something we assume. It's funny. It was so we live knowing that the world is missing out on our incredible potential to fix everything if only we had a few more resources to do it. The world would be a perfect place. If only I was in charge. It's a little bit of some arrogance and hubris on our part. Pastors, my job in particular, are well known for standing at a podium like this and speaking out in kind of a fashion of if you'd only listen to me and do what I say, everything would be perfect. Which isn't necessarily true either. So pastors are equally guilty, maybe even more so than most people of this kind of thing. We're going to cover Ecclesiastes chapter 4, and Solomon's going to shift gears a little bit in this speech. He's, he's covered some things, and Josh did a fantastic job of summarizing what we've done so far. But he's going to bring up a problem. He's going to bring up a world problem. And his conclusion is going to be kind of weird. Before we read Ecclesiastes chapter 4, we need to remember the things that Josh said. His wealth. King Solomon, we know from 1 Kings 10.4, if we did the math, earned $1.8 billion a year in gold alone. That's not a small figure. That's per year. That's not what he earned in a lifetime. That's not his lifetime net worth. That's his, an, his annual income. $1.8 billion a year. And in 1 Kings 10, 23 and 24, we realize he's, as Josh mentions, the most powerful king on the planet of his time. These are the resources at his disposal. And we need to have that in mind. We're going to start with just the first three verses of Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Think about who's talking when he says these things. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 1. Then I looked again at all the acts of oppression which were being done under the sun. And behold, I saw the tears of the oppressed, and that they had no one to comfort them. And on the side of their oppressors was power, but they had no one to comfort them. So I congratulated the dead who are, all, who are already dead more than the living who are still living. But better off than both of them is the one that has never existed who has never even seen the evil activity that is done under the sun. Okay. So, sees oppression. Check. So why doesn't it read immediately like this? So I saw oppression and I created a $250 million grant and established the Anti-Oppression Action Group to oversee distribution. And as the most powerful king in the world, I created laws that eliminated oppression, oppression in my own country and levied heavy embargoes and trade tariffs against every country that did not take similar measures. And thus, I eliminated oppression in my lifetime. Why doesn't it say that? 
Why didn't the most powerful man that we know of in the Bible as far as economic power, political power, personal power to influence, why did he see people so crushed by oppression and he said, well, there's nothing that can be done? That's a bizarre thought to me. That's hard. That's a little weird. Now as we go forward from here, it might look like he's shifting topics. He's not. And I'll show you why he's not shifting topics. Solomon is a master orator. He's, he's giving a speech. Everything is going to tie together. There's going to be things, clues that help us know that he hasn't changed topic yet. So as we move forward, I need you to understand, he's still talking about the topic of oppression. He's, he's laid down a pretty hefty issue here. He's laid down this massive problem, and he said, this is broke. And it's broke so bad that the people I see that are oppressed, some of them would have been better off just never being born, because that's how miserable and terrible and heart-wrenching their lives are in oppression. Wow. Okay. Okay. Notice that the passage reads in verse 1, on the side of the oppressors was power. On the side of the oppressors was power. What power is more powerful than the power that Solomon had at his fingertips? That's a question we've got to answer before we're done. What power is on the side of oppression that Solomon, with all of his resources, feels he cannot defeat? We need to know the answer to that question, too. Let's move forward to the next section and see if we can start putting together more arguments. We'll read verses 4 through 8 now. He's going to shift to a topic of work, which we seem to have already talked about before. So why is he bringing it up again? Starting with verse 4. And I've seen that every labor and every skill which is done is the result of rivalry. Your version may say envy. It will be either envy or rivalry. We're going to get back to that because that's an important word. Between a man and his neighbor. This too is vanity and striving after wind. The fool folds his hands and consumes his own flesh. One hand full of rest is better than two fists full of labor and striving after wind. Then I looked again at vanity under the sun, and there was a certain man without a dependent, having neither a son nor a brother. Yet there was no end to all of his labor. Indeed, his eyes were not satisfied with riches, and he never asked, for who am I laboring and depriving myself of pleasure? This too is vanity, and it is a grievous task. So we've already heard in the sermon, Paul's, or Josh has already explained He's gone to great lengths to already prove that, that human achievement is meaningless, driving after wind, it's temporary, we build bridges, they fall apart, we make buildings that go away, we, we break records, everyone forgets 50 years later, our achievements are temporary. He's already proved that at length. So why is he bringing it up again? The key word here is this envy or, or rivalry. The, the root word invite the idea of competition. Can you see that? Rivalry meaning competition or uh, because I'm envious of you, I try harder and we're competing. What do we call an environment of work which is driven by rivalry, envy, and competition? What do we call that? Capitalism or free enterprise. <laughs> That is the basis of capitalism, is it not? That we will produce better goods, better stuff, invent better things, have better industry because of competition. I am not an enemy of, of capitalism and free enterprise, by the way. I'm not saying that I'm an enemy of those things. I think that we developed amazing technologies because of this competition. Now listen to this part, though. There are people who would tell you that it is through capitalism or free enterprise or, or because of the combative nature of trade that that's how we beat oppression. 
that the way we solve the world's problems, the way we lift everybody up, the way everything gets fixed is through capitalism and free enterprise. His point is, it doesn't work. Capitalism can achieve many, many great things. Free enterprise can do a lot of stuff, but it can't fix that. It can't fix oppression. If you want proof, consider these things. We might not say that there's a lot of oppression economically in America, but America buys goods from places where they have people working virtually as slaves. And we don't even think about it. We buy a shirt. We bought it for X amount of money from Kmart. That was shipped from wherever, some third world country where the people who work there are oppressed, are oppressed badly, oppressed horribly, don't have enough to eat, do not live well, do not have any security, do not have good medical benefits, and we have no problem with the fact that we continuously, through our purchasing, oppress people, but they're just a long way away, we can't see it, it's okay. Capitalism hasn't ended oppression for someone, it's shifted it. People continue to oppress other people. Countries continue to oppress and live well on the labor and abuse of invisible sweatshop workers in some third world country. Capitalism and free enterprise don't solve the problem that he indicated that he opened this with of oppression. But there are people who would argue that that's how we fix it. Solomon says, no, that won't work things that he points out because Solomon is beginning to put some balance into his speech. If we look at 5 and 6, verse 5 and 6 com compare two things. The fool folds his hand and consumes his own flesh. In other words, both of his hands go here. He's doing nothing. The fool has nothing to live on. That's dumb. But in the next one, he says, one hand full of rest is better than two fists full of labor and striving after wind. So Solomon is saying, look, you, we've got three options here. You can be an, an idiot and just fold your hands and starve to death. Or you can work with both your hands and never have any time left to enjoy yourself. Or you can have a balance in your life and you can have one fist full of labor, the other fist full of rest, and have some balance in your life and, and live better. That's what he's trying to explain with these things of the fool with his two hands and the one handful and the two. That's what's trying to be explained. He's trying to set up this picture of work. And then in verse 8, he, he does something pretty sophisticated, but let's look at verse 8. On the surface, he's talking about just the, the futility of working and working and working and you don't have anyone to share it with or give it to or even enjoy it with you. That even if you were to die, no one else can even inherit it. Verse 8, there was a certain young man without a dependent, having neither a son nor a brother, yet there was no end to his labor. Indeed, his eyes were not satisfied with riches, and he never asked, for whom am I laboring and depriving myself of pleasure? He does something really Important here, though, he, does, he sets up what we would call an invisible comparison. Let me explain what that means. He talks about the futility of this person who has no dependents and then completely ignores the question of what about if I have 12 kids, a sick mom, and a brother who's a cripple? He ignores that. Why? Because, because that's the inferred or invisible comparison. Obviously, if that's your situation, I get it, that you have to work your tail off. I get it. I, I'm not criticizing you if you are working 12-hour shifts seven days a week because you have all these mouths to feed and there are people you're taking care of and you're it. He, see, he, he sets up this invisible comparison. He sets up the one guy as this is ridiculous and then he completely ignores the other scenario. He's, he's invisibly ex acknowledging that this scenario, he gets it. His criticism is about the person who's working, 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 but who for? Who with? And yet this also goes back to oppression because the selfishness that is inherent in our human context is that we will 
absorb for ourselves. We will pull in for ourselves. We will make ourselves rich. We will make ourselves powerful. And we really aren't thinking much about how it benefits anyone else. We're thinking about how it benefits ourselves. And he's utilizing this young man to once again explain why does increasing the world wealth not end depression? Because we're based on selfishness. Because we work hard so often. Because we want the bigger boat, the bigger house, the more prestige, the nicer necklace, the better clothes. And our attitude is so selfish, we couldn't possibly imagine. We think that if we had more money, we would help everyone else. But the truth is, if we had more money, we would just live better. That's the truth. And maybe our 10% to the church would go up a bit. But the truth of the matter is, no matter what we tell ourselves, when that income goes up, we don't take all of it and go help poor people that are hungry. We don't. We just buy better clothes. He's saying hard things. He's saying things we don't want to hear. And so he's explaining why work and, and, and economic success and, and bringing cultures up economically and more work doesn't fix oppression. Now I'm going to skip verses 9 through 12, but we are going to come back to them. We're going to skip that for a reason. We're going to go into verse 13. Now as we read this, what might think he's being hypothetical, hypothetical as in he's a story. I don't think based on the details and how specific this is that he's being hypothetical at all. I think he's talking about a current world event in his time that the other people in the room would all know about. Because that's the, that's the kind of edge that this happens. I think he's pointing to, look at that over there, let's talk about that. This country we all know about, the situation we're all aware of. Start in verse 13. A poor yet his lad is better than an old and foolish king who no longer knows how to receive instruction. That's interesting. Okay, where is he going with this? Verse 14. For he has come out of prison to become king. That's very, very specific. Even though he was born poor in his kingdom. I've seen all the living under the sun throng to the side of the second lad who replaced in other words, the lad that replaced the, the old king. I can see everybody, I've seen everybody be so excited about this young man who's replacing the king. Verse 16, there is no end to all the people, to all who are before them, and even the ones who will come later, who will not be happy with him. This is the young man now, for this too is vanity and striving after wind. What is he trying to say? And, and our translation is a little bit clumsy in bringing it out. Well, he's explaining a scenario about politics. If we're going to look at how do we end oppression, we are either going to go to economy or we're going to go to politics. How do we stop people being oppressed? So he said economy's not going to do it. Now he's going to talk about politics. This young, we got an old king, right, who no longer knows how to receive instruction. So there's some guy in power, there's a king of some region somewhere who everyone hates him because he's out of touch. The people try to tell him, hey, we're starving over here, or we need more things over here, or we need a new law, and he's not receiving instruction. He's not taking any data in. He's just living in his authority, he's happy the way things are, he's not adjustable, he's not, he's not moving. He's, in, he's unpopular. He's king, but he's not popular. The person that's replacing him is a poor person. That's interesting. A poor person who's been in prison. A poor person who's been in prison, who's now going to be launched into politics. I can't prove this. Chances are pretty high. The reason he's in prison is because he opened his mouth in the first place. Chances are really high in a scenario like this. He's in prison because he's a political person. He's in prison because he shouted out against the king. He's the guy who said, hey, idiot, listen to us. We're, we're starving to death out here. We need new policies. We need things. And the king threw him in prison. I cannot prove that from the text, but it is very reasonable from the scenario that we're looking at that that's why he's in prison. So we got this young guy who came from the poor, who's probably popular with the people, and he's in, he may even been thrown in prison. Would we not say 
someone who's been in prison has been oppressed? Right? If I've gone to prison, if I've been in prison, I've certainly been oppressed. So what is this? This is a young man who's been poor, who's been oppressed. And he's going to be the new king. And boy, isn't everyone excited. Everyone's excited about political renewal, political change. Even though this isn't a democracy, this is representative government, right? This is a poor guy who's been in prison who can relate to us. He's going to relate to the people. He's going to be a people's king. Surely new representational government that understands oppression, who understands the needs of the poor, that's the guy that can fix oppression for us. Except that Solomon says in verse 16 that in the times that come later, there will be no end to the people who are not happy with him. He will not succeed. Not permanently. Not in a lasting way. He'll make changes and he'll be popular and he'll make decisions. And as time goes on, his decisions... They aren't going to have quite the effect everyone has hoped. And that's not going to be quite the utopia everybody planned for. It's not going to be quite as amazing as everyone thought. And as more and more time goes on, and he just proves to be a guy trying to get things done who fails all the time, then the complaints are going to start. There's great oppression. And the tears bring no one to comfort them. Economic advancement, hard work, and invention, and competition will not solve it, nor will political revolution and representative government and new blood and positions of power. It will also not fix it. We as human beings have no solution to oppression, whether you're Solomon or Bill Gates or Scott Morrison. Why? What is the power on the side of oppression that makes it impossible, seemingly impossible, to defeat? I'm going to read from a letter written by James to the early church. This is early Christians. This will be in James chapter 4. James chapter 4. He's writing to Christians who are oppressing one another. If you read the book of James, you'll discover they had a, a rich people, poor people problem. The rich people were oppressing the poor. They were saying that we get to talk and you don't, and we get to sit in the front and you don't, and, and we're more important than you because we're wealthier than you. We had oppression in the early church. First, first baby steps of the church, oppression right here in our building. This is what James has to say to them about why there is oppression in the church. Chapter 4, starting in 1, I'm going to go to verse 6. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasure that wage war in your members? You lust and you do not have, so you commit murder. And you are envious and cannot obtain, and you fight and you quarrel, quarrel and you do not have because you do not ask. And when you do ask, verse 3, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God, or do you think that the Scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the Spirit which he has made to dwell in us, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. i tell you why we cannot easily beat the power of oppression. Here it is. Because it comes out of every living human being on the planet. Because we generate. We all generate it. You know, you know what's funny? Is, is in, my, in my home country of America, there are, there are slums where they are, they are rioting right now about the oppression done to them. I mean, they're, they're, not today, but, but in general, and you know about this, breaking store windows because they feel like they're 
oppressed by the police. But you know what? If you go into that little neighborhood, guess what you find? That the more powerful in that neighborhood are oppressing the less powerful in that neighborhood. That the ones who have money are oppressing the ones who don't. That the ones who deal drugs are oppressing the ones that are under the drugs. You find that the oppression never ends no longer, no matter how low you go. It doesn't matter where you start, no matter how far the channel you get, we keep oppressing each other all the way down to the bottom. Human beings oppress one another. And it is a massive global problem that no power, no economy, no politician can solve because we generate it. It comes from us. We consume without thinking. We demand without caring. We are annoyed when any convenience is lost, even just for a few hours. We demand our rights and our privileges and our comforts and our luxuries, and we care virtually nothing for those who provide them. Whole countries oppress whole other countries. Cultures oppress cultures. Classes oppress lower classes. Races oppress other races. The educated oppress the uneducated. The physically strong oppress the physically weak. The power of oppression is generated by the unbridled wants, lusts, and selfish desires of every human being. And the philosopher might ask, good God allows such evil completely missing the truth that the only way to remove that evil would be to kill every living human being on the earth. That, you know, where does evil come from? Us. Why doesn't God just get rid of all people? Oh, it'd be a beautiful planet with trees and flowers and, and cows, but no people. We'd be gone. And this all becomes very grim. This isn't very good news to think about. But there is hope. James tells us what the hope is in this letter. In verse 4 or verse 5 of chapter 4, he tells us what the solution is. Or do you not know the scripture that speaks, doesn't speak to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. Here's God's plan to solve the question. He takes his spirit and he puts it inside us so that finally there's an age that can defeat our lust, our need, our need for more, our need to be greater, our need to be more important. Finally, there is an agent in us that can start to change us, rebuild us, remold us, reform us into something different. An agent that goes with us everywhere. All the time. And can defeat oppression the only way it can be done, one person at a time. Now, having said that, Solomon, back in his letter, did have some advice about how to deal with oppression. That we should combine with our idea of the Spirit working in us to change us. And that weapon is the power of unity. Let's read verses 9 through 12. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another one to lift him, lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how will warm one be warm? And verse 12 is the big one. If one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. The cord of three stands is not quickly torn apart. It is not to be overpowered to be oppressed. That's the same thing. One is easily oppressed. Two is more difficult to oppress. Three is even more difficult than two. That's his advice. Unity. See, I can't stop global oppression. I can decide to the power of the Holy Spirit not to oppress you. And you can decide not to oppress me. And then we have two. We can go find someone else. We can decide not to oppress them, and they can decide not to oppress us, and we can have three. Now we have something. We have freedom there in that relationship. And we can invite more. 
Why stop at three? Have you ever, he says, a cord of three strands is not easily broken. Absolutely true. Have you ever seen a rope of a thousand strands? I have. That's a whole new level of not breakable. That's some serious not breakable if you've seen a rope like that. This is who we're meant to be as the body of Christ. We're supposed to be this nexus that grow, that grew and it grew and it grew. And as the body of Christ, whether I've even met you or not, we are to be a rope of strands that will not oppress each other, that will stand together, that will keep each other warm, that will provide provision, that will lift up when someone else falls, that will be there no matter what happens. That we will take care of one another regardless of what other thing is there is about you, whether you're poor or rich or brown or red or white or, or an educator or no education at all or whether we even speak the same language. Shouldn't matter. In the face of oppression is find company. Find someone you can trust. Stand together. But James speaks to the early church and says, hey, you should be the strongest rope in the history of mankind. You have the Holy Spirit in you. You should be unbreakable. But here you are fighting and arguing and oppressing one another. Stop. That's James' admonition to the church. That you have the potential to have a unity that no one else could possibly touch. Yet here in the church we still find oppression. Friends, we are the church. The only hope of freedom for the entire world resides in us. Not so that we can make politics fix oppression. Politics can't fix it. The church can. Not that the church can make economics fix oppression. No, economics still can't fix it. The church itself must fix it. Not through the agent of politics, not through the agent of, of economics, not through the agents of government, not through the agents of anything. The church itself should be in the process of ending, fixing, battling oppression as itself. Across borders, across cultures, across people groups, across language barriers. We are the church, and we exist globally. Consider going back to chapter 4, verse 2, and I'm going to read this again. This is the description of the world without the church. This is the description of the world without the church. So I congratulated the dead who are already dead more than the living who are still living, but better off for both of them than the one who has never existed, who has never seen the evil activity that's done under the sun. That's what the world has to look forward to without the church. That is life without the church. And we cower and we wonder and we worry. Lord, we are, we are the only hope they have. the power on earth. I don't know where you're at personally with God. I don't know if you know Jesus Christ as Savior. Here's the thing. If you've been battling those, those things in you that you know are wrong, if you've been battling look, I know I lose my temper sometimes, and I know I'm not really kind sometimes, and I know that I I treat people the way I shouldn't sometimes, and I just, I, I'm trying to fix it. You, you can't fix it. God can fix it. The Holy Spirit can fix it. And whether it is you need to come and, and meet and just meet Jesus for the first time so the Holy Spirit's... Or maybe it's just been a while since you even thought about the Holy Spirit changing you to submitting to the power of God, to saying, God, I'm really messing this up. And I, I'm done messing this up. And I'm ready for you to fix it. We, we've got to understand, church, we can still oppress each other in our families, with our friends, in the church, if we don't continue to allow the Holy Spirit to change us and mold us and direct us into who we need to be. 
We can, we can be the evil that's out there if we don't continually submit to the Holy Spirit. And whether you need to come forward or meet with me afterwards, just meet Jesus for the first time, or whether you just need to, to get right again, it is a dark, dark thing doing as people, and the solution is in us changing who we are. There is no other way. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are reminded by Solomon that, that it, the world is a dark place, and there's a darkness here. There's an evil that we do to each other. We are evil to one another, and it comes out of us. And Solomon, in all of his power, couldn't defeat it with politics, and Solomon, with all of his wealth, couldn't solve it with money. Solomon, all of his power, said that the power behind oppression was greater than what he could deal with. Lord, we know that, that these come from the sin nature, from the ugliness that's within us. God, we submit ourselves to you. Lord, if we have been mistreating the important people in our lives, if we have been mistreating each other in the church. Lord, we submit ourselves to you because that shouldn't be here. We're supposed to be the place where that doesn't happen anymore. We need you. We need you to change us and fix us and, and pull off the starts that we've added and, and add the things that we're missing We need you. God, would you, would you meet us in our need? Would you, would you spur us with your Holy Spirit to cry out in repentance if we need to? And Lord, would you constantly remind us that our hope and that the world's hope comes from what you're doing in the church. That is the sole place where freedom from oppression can happen for real. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.